Good evening. Thank you all for being with us on our very first uh, redistricting community meeting. It's wonderful to see this room um, so full this evening and as we announced that we would be beginning a comprehensive redistricting process and sought committee members that we had such an overwhelming interest in folks having their voices heard and representing their communities on our respective committees. I can tell you um, as a superintendent, by the way I should have introduced myself, I'm making an assumption you know who I am, you're saying who is this lady? I'm Amy Cashwell, superintendent in Henrico Schools, um, and again, welcome you and um, tell you how appreciative we are that you're giving up your time for this critically important process. As we endeavor to um, resolve the redistricting issues for a number of reasons, and we'll get into more of that and what the process looks like, um, our number one priority is that our community voices um, are heard. And so as we enter this process, we're making sure that we're doing what's best, not just for one community, but for all of the communities within Henrico. So um, we're thrilled to have you be a part of this and are looking forward to kicking off um, both this meeting and then our elementary committee will meet this evening, later this week, our secondary committee, and we'll spend some time outlining the, the process at large for the whole group this evening. But before we move on and do that, I would like to introduce Reverend Dr. Cooper, who is the school board member from the Fairfield District. He's with us this evening and would like to bring some greetings and then we'll turn it over um, to staff. Can we just give our superintendent a hand tonight as we begin? I want you to applaud her. I, I tell people that um, Dr. Cashwell has only been on the job for one year. Um, and she has hit the ground running and she has a sense of urgency um, about her administration, which I am truly appreciative of as a school board member. I want to first and foremost say thank you to each of you all. Um, I got involved years ago. I volunteered my time um, on a committee that addressed inequities in our county um, because it's been an issue that's been the undercurrent for a long time as far as equity and resource allocation. Um, until we deal with language, until we deal with perception, until we deal with reality, we never can really deal with the real root of the, the cause of the situation. So this is the first time in 10 years that we've done a comprehensive redistricting. And I'm truly excited that we have decided to engage and to involve our members from every one of our schools, 72 schools strong across the county. And so I just had to be here tonight uh, representing 13 of those schools from the Fairfield District um, and I'm really excited and I'm really appreciative for you all to just give of your time, to give of your talent. Um, this is going to be a, a great um, undertaking. It's going to have some highs, some lows, some mountains, some valleys, but I believe that together we can definitely navigate um, the course that is ahead. So that being said, again, thank you so much for volunteering. Thank you so much for taking your time out from your families, from your schedules. And thank you for caring about this community and also all about children in our county for us to have a successful uh, uh, redistricting process. That being said, I'm going to bring Mr. Matt Cropper up to, um, to, to address us. Come on, let's give him a hand as he comes. Ms. Cropper. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell, for, uh, for that. And thank you all for coming. We really appreciate uh, your participation in this process. It's really important to have the public be a part of this process, to observe and to participate. And uh, so what we want to do tonight, before I get into too many details about the project, a little bit of an overview on us. We are Cropper GIS Consulting. We're based out of Ohio, but we do this kind of work for districts all over the United States. Uh, our specialty is school redistricting. Other districts call it rezoning, maybe realignment, but it's all pretty much the same thing. Basically looking at um, how to configure zone lines to accomplish our objectives. Uh, we've worked with districts all over, done a lot of work in Virginia as well. Uh, we have done some work in Henrico. We worked here back in 2008, the last time they did a comprehensive redistricting process here. And I've also helped uh, provide consultation to them as they did some middle school redistricting a few years ago. Uh, but we're honored to be back here again. And we've worked with other divisions in the, in the, in the state as well as other places across the United States. Um, in addition to um, working with public schools, we also work with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights and help them provide, cons provide consultation to them reg regarding federal desegregation cases and things like that. Um, but that's not really what, what we're here for in this process. It's really focused on, uh, on trying to build some zones around some, for some specific parameters. 
But I am Matthew Cropper. I will be working with the committee and also you'll see me at all the meetings and I will be facilitating the work of this process. I have over 20 years experience and, uh, and, and really I'm honored to be working in this. It is my passion. It's something that I really uh, value a lot in, in focusing on what's best for all children in every community that we work in. So um, why are we here? So why is there a need to redistrict in Henrico County? Um, so the school board has initiated a community-based process to meet four goals. To efficiently use all available space and to plan for future growth. To determine attendance boundaries for the expanded Holiday Elementary School, which is going to double in size and affect the 2021-22 school year. So that school is overcrowded right now. There are other schools around that school that are overcrowded. And so that's going to help provide relief to a lot of schools in, to schools in that area is the expectation. Also to account for increased building capacity available when uh, replacements for Highland Springs and J.R. Tucker High School open their current sites for the same year, 2021-22. So uh, those schools are being rebuilt on the same footprint or on the same site that they're on right now, um, but they are gonna have a different capacity and that's also gonna have to be looked at to see how can we make use of that to provide relief to schools in the area. And finally, we're looking at reducing concentrations of poverty while balancing a neighborhood or community school concept. So see if there are any opportunities without deviating too far from our other criteria and objectives, but uh, to help tr tr provide a balance of some of this and uh, try to create uh, zones that help relieve some of the imbalances that may exist as it relates to uh, high poverty and non-high poverty schools, especially if they're adjacent to each other and things like that. So there are some rules to follow and these are called procedural guidelines. Um, and the district has developed uh, some policy and procedures to help guide any group who does this. These are, these are the, the guiding principles, uh, procedural guidelines that we worked on back in 2008 as well. And um, if you wanted to, to, to look at any of this material, this is all available online. And these, these, guiding, these uh, procedural guidelines are there as well. But these are to, to look at major roads and natural boundaries when feasible to define attendance zones. Um, all reasonable efforts should be made to ensure contiguous geographic zones with, which minimize division of clearly identifiable community components. So um, that's, that really means don't, don't create a satellite zone that's disconnected from the main zone for a school and bus students in, in, uh, past a couple schools to get to that school. That's what they mean by uh, one contiguous zone. Don't start creating what we refer to sometimes as called satellite areas, enclaves. Those kind of things are what, what uh, school districts usually stay away from in terms of best practice. And then while doing that, also minimize the division of neighborhoods and communities. Try not to draw the line down the middle of a residential street. Thinking of when you're drawing lines, when you're developing boundaries for schools, you want to try to keep communities intact if at all possible. You don't want to draw the line down a residential street. And it helps for many reasons, for so the social aspect in particular, and kids making friends, families making friends with people across the street. You want that to sort of build on that dynamic so that they can go to the community schools together. And then also, um, it helps with other things like transportation. So, um, and also, all legal and judicial guidelines for the maintenance in, of a unitary school system will be strictly adhered to. Efforts were made to establish walking, walking schools and reasonable walking zones were feasible. So try to maximize walkability. If a student can walk to school, maintain that opportunity for students and try not to put in students who can walk to a building on a bus, if at all possible. Um, ensure efficient system of school bus transportation. So that goes in, in line with proximity and walkability. If you try to have the zones, the neighborhoods and communities feeding as close to their school as possible, that maximizes transportation efficiency and, and avoids um, and, and, and prevents uh, inefficient transportation costs. Provisions should be made to ensure the continuity of a child's K-12 progress and th this may be accomplished by offering older students in a school the option to remain at an existing school if parents provide transportation. This is something that's not really a, a guideline that the committee can focus on. It's more of a policy driven uh, measure that we see in all criteria and all guiding principles it basically, another uh, term that you, that you see this is called grandfathering. It's allowing students who may be coming up to their final year at a school um, to continue at that school so they not have to go to a different school in their last year. But the, the caveat to that is that the parent has to provide transportation. The parent or the guardian has to make sure that their child is, is uh, safely brought to school. 
Implementation of a plan over a span of several years would be preferable if it has the effect of minimizing the need for additional line changes for a community or near future. So be, be proactive of, uh, on the future, not only be mindful of what we currently have, but be, but be mindful of, uh, of, of future potential zones and things like that. Our focus here is 2021-22. Uh, so we have a clear focus here on, in, a, in a timeline to, 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 to work towards. We're not working with phasing here, which sometimes we have to do phasing of, of planning here and as it relates to some of when we do redistricting in some places. But in this case, we're focused strictly on 2021-22 is the implementation year for all the zones and all this, the new school construction that we're focusing on. So let's talk a little bit about the process. There are three phases to this redistricting study. It's the uh, first phase is committee application, development, review, and selection. And we've gone through that process and we've finalized that process. We have uh, gone through a whole process of, of soliciting applications and selected committee members. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. We're putting the information together and developing what we call a background report for starters. And that, we'll be giving that to uh, the elementary committee tonight. And we'll be giving it to the middle school group um, on Wednesday. And then the third process is analyzing data and developing options, uh, meeting with uh, committee, board, and, and public, and engaging everybody in an open and transparent process. So talking about the applications, um, we had, I think it was about 250 or so applications uh, when, we, when we reached out to the public to try to get people who are interested. There was a lot of uh, uh, well-qualified people. We had, to, we had to pick 66 of that group. So there were people who applied who were, who were not able to serve on this committee. Um, and I, and I talk, reached out to them and told them that, you know, it wasn't necessarily because they were not qualified, but we had to pick a certain number of people. There are 66 volunteers that sit on this committee, um, and they were basically chosen based on where they live. What we wanted to do is we wanted to ensure that there was committee members who live in all different areas of the county. So I actually took your applications and I mapped them out so I could see where all the committee members live based on the address that they gave me. And um, what we, the perfect committee is one that looks almost like a grid, grid pattern across the whole school division so that you have people who live in all different areas and all different communities across the county and they can provide us perspectives on what's, what it's like in the area they live and shop and work and things like that. And so they, they can really tell us what, what it's like, where they're where they coming from and they can help provide that local perspective that we need uh, on this committee. Um, although you are, do live in a certain school attendance area, uh, committee members, you are gonna be focused on providing a plan and options and, a and eventually a recommendation that best meets the needs of all children and all students in this county, not just focusing on your particular area or uh, the area that you live in. You know, although you know a lot about the area that you live in and that you come from, it's important to, to think outside that box and focus on the bigger picture here, on what's best for all children. Even if it may impact your community or your neighborhood, um, it's important to, to, to really address what's best for all. We have, so with 66 uh, members on this committee, we've broken it up into two different subcommittees to, have a, 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 to be able to, to break it down into small, more manageable groups to work with as well as focusing on different components of the planning work. So we have an elementary schools committee, and then we have a middle high school, as, as what's also referred to as a secondary committee. And uh, so the elementary group is gonna be meeting tonight as orientation, and then the middle school, high school, secondary group is meeting at Glen Allen on Wednesday after our public information session there. So we'll be working with both of these groups, and then the, the, the way we work with them is as we, as consultants, work on uh, developing options, in, in, in taking your feedback and drawing options, we'll be looking at meshing those together. And so the, the elementary group will have the advantage of seeing middle school and high school options because they are uh, married together. They are, they are built together. And the middle high school group will also have elementary options. So we'll be working with these independent groups, but we'll also be taking that in, in input from both groups as in, in working on combining them so that they can be in sync for different reasons. So I've already touched on this. Each of the committees that do have, you were selected based on the, the, the attendance area that they live in for elementary, middle, or high school. But the focus is not only just to stay focused on your school, 
uh, as a committee member. You will be focused on, on a, building a plan that, that best meets the needs of all children, all students throughout the county. We started this back in, in the summer of 2019. Um, and, uh, and so and we finalized that uh, just about a month ago. And uh, the application was accept, applications were accepted all the way through June. And it took quite, quite a while to get all the committee together to get confirmations and everything like that. But we have a really good group uh, that comes from all over the area. We did meet our objectives as it relates to the committee. Some of the final things about the committee is that um, we wanted to make sure that they're from all over, uh, that they, different regions of the, of the, of the county are equally represented, represented uh, cross-section and represented body of citizens. So we're not only looking for where you live, we're also looking for the quality of your application, making sure that, that you gave us thoughtful answers and not uh, and, and that, you, that, you, that you thought about the application and gave us good, thoughtful responses. And, um, and we're looking for objectivity. So uh, really the focus with this group is to take off your parent hat, take off your, uh, your um, community member hat, and focus on, put on your committee hat, and focus on what's best for all children. So that's really the, that's really the focus, and I'm, I'm confident that the group that we have will be able to do that. So we've put data together, we've put a lot of information to help for starters and, uh, and put it together into what we call a background report. But this contains information about, um, about schools, where the schools are located, the boundaries, uh, uh, membership numbers, what's the capacity of the schools, color-coded maps that show which schools are overcrowded versus underutilized to help inform you guys as committee members to understand where the overcrowding is, where the undercrowding is, where you may be able to uh, move zone lines to balance them out to make them more equitable in terms of utilization and things like that. So that information is a, some of the things that we've put together in this initial report that, we've, uh, that we're sharing with you. Also have data from the Census Bureau and, um, and uh, so we've really collected information from all different sources and, we, and we'll continue to collect information from sources as the committee continues to work. If they bring up a thought about something they'd like to see additional information, we, will, we, we are here for you as a committee member, as a consultants and staff, and help to empower you guys to be able to make decisions with as you work through this. So we put it all into maps, uh, into what we call a GIS, a geographic information system, so that we can uh, analyze data on it from a mapping perspective, make accurate and informed decisions. We have um, a lot of information that's, that's down to the address level, so we can count students on any particular school, uh, any particular street, and, and know how many students live there, what grade levels they're in, and things like that. And so, that, so some of this information has all been put into more simplified version for the public and also the committee uh, through, uh, through mapping and, and tables and such. We've created a background report, and this is what the starting document that has a lot of information, and this is uh, also available online, so any member of the public can go download this and print this off and start to, start, start to follow the process just like the committee is doing. This has a lot of information um, that, that good background data basically helps to inform you and, and so that you can share a consistent and accurate message. People want to know what's the capacity of the school. You don't have to speculate. You can go to the document and find out how many students are there, what's the capacity of the school, enrollment, that type of information. We've also put some uh, other pretty advanced statistics in here that kind of help you understand what this is. Uh, it's called a live attend matrix. And this helps you see how many students are, where students are living versus attending school. How many students live in a zone that don't go to school at that, at, 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 don't go to school at, in this zone that they live in how many students are traveling into a school from out of zone. For elementary, most of them, most of the students go to the school that they're zoned for. But you get into middle and high schools, there's a lot of students that are attending in from out of zone. For instance, Moody Middle School has a lot of students, I think almost half the enrollment's coming from out of zone because they have a specialty program there. So as we work through our process with the middle and high school group, we'll be uh, an, uh, analyzing that and, and estimating our enrollment to anticipate those students coming in so we don't fill a zone up with students um, living inside the zone, and then there are not enough seats for students to come in from out of zone, for example. Information such as attendance boundary maps, so that you can see the background colors, shows the current boundaries for each school. And then when we start getting into options development, 
these, these bold black outlines will remain and then the background color will start to change. So you can start to see how the options differ from the current boundaries. We're not there yet. That's gonna be coming in a couple of weeks when we start getting into options at our first committee meeting. But uh, this is just a starting point. Information on in membership versus capacity. So you can see it's a color, color scheme here. The lower uh, utilized buildings are lighter colors all the way to the darker colors or the over uh, the more heavier utilized to overcrowded spaces. And you can see where there's differences, where there's darker colored schools, this is Holiday Elementary, uh, versus lighter colored zones and things like that, where there may be some opportunity to try to bring these into more of the middle ground and try to get rid of the lighter colored areas and the dark colored areas and try to, try to level out and balance out some utilization. That'll be some of the work that, that we will be working on with the committee. There's something that you see, that you'll see in your data, they're called census tracts. Um, and what these are is each, each elementary attendance area is broken down into smaller bits and smaller, what we call sometimes planning blocks. They're building blocks for redistricting. So when you look at these, these basically show you, um, there's information that we provide in, for each of these census tracts that shows you the number of students that live inside each of those little census tracts that go to their zone school. Um, and as you start working, as the committee starts working, as the public starts working through this, this helps inform you and empowers you with the ability to see, um, well, why do they move this line here instead of over there? Well, you can look at these census tract numbers and say, okay, well, there's 100 kids in one tract where there's maybe five or 10 in another census tract, and that may help, un help you understand. Um, it also helps the committee uh, with, um, gives the committee the ability to look at creating new options. So we, you know, we'll, we'll bring some options to the committee for starting points at the next committee meeting. But we're, tonight at the orientation, we're gonna ask the committee to, um, to look at the maps and we're gonna give them some what we call black and white sketch maps so that they can start to look and see, maybe shade in some areas that they think would be ideal to move from one school to another. Or they can create their own map if they want off of that sketch map. So um, these census tract maps and this data is important in informing you and how many students live in the various subsections and various parts of the, of the school division across the county. Um, there's an online map that's out there that we will keep building and adding to. This is an interactive map that you can go on from any phone or laptop. It's croppermap.com slash Henrico. And it's a site, it's, it's something that we use in all the school districts that we work in. A very effective tool for people to be able to zoom in um, on an area. You can turn on different um, imagery if you want to look at uh, background imagery. Uh, let's look at like an aerial photo so you can see actually what's on the ground. You can turn on and off the different census tract maps and the different elementary or middle or high school attendance areas so that it really helps inform you of what of uh, looking at all the mapping data that we have in a virtual sort of digital interactive uh, method. Um, when options start to come out, we'll be putting options on here as well. So you can turn on option one, look at current, option one, option two, and be able to see how they differ and zoom around and things like that. It's a very useful tool, it's something that I use a lot uh, to help me and it certainly helps uh, communities and committees. So um, we will, uh, what we like to do is we like to create what we call a um, baseline options. When we get to this first meeting in September, which will be September 23rd for this elementary group, I'm gonna be bringing a couple of maps to you. I'm thinking two options for starters to show you what, you know, just to help kickstart brains and heart, get, the, get, get the ball rolling so that you can understand um, what, how, many, how the options, the zones could be configured. That doesn't mean that you have to take those. It's just basically, it's something to help start facilitate the discussion. These options can be uh, scrapped, they can be modified, or uh, you, know, you can create brand new options uh, from scratch if you'd like. So, um, so we will be working with that, and, um, and really the focus is to develop some plans and options to bring to the public in November as part of your first phase of work as a committee. So we're looking at uh, a lot of information here as it relates to utilization, but also we're looking at feeder pattern continuity, looking at elementary to middle and middle school to high school progression and seeing how that is impacted. What are the current, what we refer to as feeder patterns? 
What are the current feeder patterns? How much of an elementary splits to a middle school? What percentage of the elementary splits to a middle? And likewise, how much of a middle school splits to a high school? In a perfect world, you wanna, if you have to split a school, which many times you do have to split schools, um, it's best to have a balanced split. A 50-50 split is most ideal if you have to split a school. What you wanna try to avoid are like a 95% of an elementary school going to one middle and then 5% of that, that elementary going to another. You know, thinking about children, when they move to the next level, they want to have familiar faces, going to lunch, especially you know, going from elementary to middle is a scary time for children. So you want to make sure that they, that they you know, build on those social dynamics that they've made at elementary. When they go to middle school, they can have familiar faces and things like that. And so um, we look at elementaries and then we typically use those elementaries as building blocks for the middle schools. And then the middle schools are building blocks for the high schools. As you, as you move up the ladder there, from elementary to middle high, you have fewer schools to work with. And so it's always very common, if not uh, most common, that schools do have to start getting split as you start to move up. But it's something that we'll be aware of. It's something that we will work for, work towards, to try to make sure it's an efficient process and an efficient feeder progression as they go, um, as they work up the ladder. This next slide is one that's tough, tough, impossible for people to read and hear, um, but you also, you, you, there is a um, handout that you could have picked up. It shows all this information on the back of that handout, shows all the meetings for committees, elementary and secondary groups, and then there's also school board updates that are, that are embedded in there and public information sessions. But you can see here we are in September. Um, we have a long way to go. This committee is working all the way until May of, uh, well, the last committee meeting is in April of 2020. So there's a lot of work, a lot of meetings. Um, we're asking that the elementary committees um, uh, just attend, they only have to attend their elementary committee meetings. And there's also some full committee meetings uh, on the schedule, as well as the public information sessions. We ask the committee to go to that. And then likewise, the middle high school group goes to just their middle school, high school meetings, and then the full committee meeting and public information sessions. So it looks overwhelming, but uh, as you as members of the public, uh, you can follow the process. You're more than welcome to come to all of these. We enable an open and transparent process here. Um, any meeting that we have, we invite the public to come as ob observe the process, and you can just watch, watch the work that's being done by the committee. We have nothing to hide, and it's actually better for you to watch and be informed in, in the work that's being done by the committee. So how can the public participate? There are many ways to participate. Like I said, members of the public are welcome to attend any meeting as observers but not participants. So we don't do an open mic or Q&A at these committee meetings. We, uh, we, you're there as observers, but I'm always there after meetings to talk to people. If you have questions or you have something for me, I'm more than happy to talk with you if we have time. All the materials that we share with these committees are, are going to be posted online. Um, this presentation, as well as the uh, presentation for the orientation that's coming up after this, and the, um, and the agenda, the, the, all that information that we're sharing with the committee tonight, as well as the background report is available online so that any member of the public can start to download things and, and print off things if they want. Um, there's also a general feedback form on the redistricting page. If you go to the Henrico County Schools redistricting page, there's a general feedback form there. And we're tracking comments as people uh, at the early part of this process, even before we get to a public information session, we're looking at to, for information and input from the public. As you guys provide input to us on that general feedback form, we'll be tracking that and we'll be reporting that back to the committee so that they can understand what's, what's being said and what the concerns are from, uh, uh, and thoughts, you know, positives and negatives of what people think about some of the work, the process, or the maps. So that's something that I encourage you to look at and as you start to, if you start thinking about things about the redistricting, put your thoughts on the, on the feedback form so that we can all benefit from that. And then there are public input sessions on November 7th and 13th. Um, those are designed for the, uh, that's the point in time where the committee has done a good body of work. They've evaluated options, but then they've narrowed down to maybe three options. It, depend, it really depends on what the committee wants to do at that point. But at this point in November, early November, the committee will be at a point where they feel like they're ready to share some draft maps to the public and get some additional feedback from the public. And we'll have a survey uh, structured for that, at that process at that time where the public can uh, fill out the survey and we'll analyze 
the, the, your comments and continue our work. Um, there's going to be another public information session on March 4th and 5th where the committee is starting to get near the finish line, where they're starting to get close to, to formulating a recommendation at that point, and, and that's when they're going to go back to the public again and, and solicit more input and get some feedback from you, in addition to the other measures and other ways that we're collecting input. So you can see that we're really focused on, on making sure that the committee is one part of this process and uh, the public is, is certainly involved in this process. Even if you're not on the committee, you can participate and provide uh, invaluable uh, input for this, for this process, okay? So at, with that said, that's all I have for tonight's meeting um, for, the, for the public input session. I really encourage you guys to follow the process. Our first committee meeting is September 23rd. And, uh, and if you look on your calendar that's in the back, all the meeting dates and locations are on there. We welcome you guys to, to, to attend those, to observe. And, um, and uh, we, our next meeting, uh, we're gonna have a public information session at Glen Allen High School on Wednesday. And we're gonna cover the same, pr the same presentation at that time. And then after that, we're gonna meet with the middle school, high school group, okay? So thank you all for coming out and look forward to working with you over the next uh, half of a year or so. Thank you very much. Okay, committee, so give me just uh, like, uh, well, we're supposed to start at 7.30 with the committee. Let me take a look at attendance and uh, give us like five minutes to, to regroup with the committee orientation process and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll uh, figure out where, when we're going to start next.